Good morning. It is so good to see so many here this morning. I want to begin today by saying Happy Easter. It is wonderful to be here today. And I, I was so encouraged. I was making my rounds this morning, kind of talking to people. I went to say hello to Herman Cain. The first thing he said to me is, he is risen, and he is risen. We are so thrilled to be here today to celebrate the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Today is a day in our country, in our world, where people are reflecting on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe they don't do that 364 days out of the year, but this one day out of the year, they reflect on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What we want to do this morning is to take a very encapsulated look at the entire life of Christ, beginning with his birth and leading up to the resurrection, ending with the resurrection today. And I hope that you understand that we are so blessed that every day we get to live in the shadow of Jesus Christ, to know that he is providing everything that we need, that he is our savior, that he is the mediator of a new covenant, that he is the author and perfecter of our faith. I want to share a quote with you as we get started this morning that I think kind of encapsulates what we're trying to do today. The figures of speech that relate the church directly to Christ give him the preeminence. He is the whole body, or where distinguished from the body, he is its head. In the family of God, he is the elder brother, the son over the household. He is the husband of the church, his bride. He is the vine and the rightful heir and representative of the owner of the vineyard. He is the shepherd of the sheep and the gate into the sheepfold. He is the cornerstone of the new spiritual temple in which God dwells by the Spirit. The church is the assembly of God's people gathered in Christ's name to invoke a category derived from Old Testament studies. The collective personality of the church is supplied by Christ. This is whom we have come to celebrate today. This is whom we are going to learn from today. We're going to read a lot of scripture today because scripture is where we find the story of Jesus Christ. Scripture is where we find the power of the resurrection that we have come to share today. I want to, before we begin, to say thank you to our worship leaders, to David and to Greg. We've had a few of these kind of special services here recently. These don't happen without these guys. They really work hard. They're not paid to do it, and I am so thankful for them. And so, David, come lead us in some songs this morning. Joy to the world.
first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said unto them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Would you pray with me? Our Father, to you belongs all the glory and honor. You showed us your redeeming love from the beginning when everything you had created was perfect and good. Man chose to disobey you and that love gave to you the, the plan that you had for us that you would send your son and he would come and be born of a woman as, and live a life on this earth, a perfect life, a sinless life. But man disobeyed from the beginning and chose even to take your son from us. But with your power, you raised him from the dead, Father, and in so doing, Father, you gave us hope, a hope that we would not have had had it not been for that love, for the willingness of your son to die for all mankind. He shed his blood, but he rose from the dead, and that is the beautiful thing, the thing that, that allows us to come back to you at one day. So thank you, Father. We do praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the ninth chapter of Isaiah, we read, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. These are the words given to Isaiah the prophet by God 700 years before Jesus was born. We knew that there was a Savior coming. We knew that this child would be special and different, that he would grow up and he would be a leader, that he would take us from the captivity of sin and lead us into a new covenant. And it was prophesied. There was no child who had ever been born or who would ever be born in the way that Jesus was born. This was predestined. This was the plan from the beginning. Oftentimes, I think sometimes we, we think that we look at the Old Testament, we look at the Old Covenant, we think that, that maybe this new covenant is an afterthought, but far from it. 
This was the plan from the very beginning. If we go to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, we read, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. We all know the story of Mary and Joseph traveling and, and stopping in Bethlehem. And there was no room in the inn, and so they said, you can use the barn. And we know the Savior of the world was brought into the world and laid in a manger where animals would eat from. We know that story, and it's a wonderful story. It's a story like none other. But sometimes I think we forget about what led up to that story and what happens after that story. I think sometimes we forget about this unwed teenage mother who was told she was going to bring the Savior into the world. I think we forget about a good man, a carpenter named Joseph, who wanted nothing more than to marry this beautiful young woman, to have a family with her only to find out that she was pregnant already. And he respected her so much that he was going to very quietly in that relationship. I think we forget about those things sometimes. I think we forget about the fact that Jesus wasn't born into money. We forget about the fact that his birth was shrouded with gossip and conjecture. And yet, this unwed teenage mother, when she found out she was going to bring this child in the world, she said, my soul magnifies the Lord our God. This is the Savior of the world. This is who we have come together to celebrate and to worship today. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see.
Imagine if you would your best friend writing a biography of your life. Someone that knew you so well, someone that was like family to you, someone that spent years and years of their life walking side by side with you. If you can imagine that, then you have a good understanding of what the Gospel of John is. In the Gospel of John, we read, by the disciple whom Jesus loved wrote this, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I was trying to share with somebody, a friend of mine this week, what we were going to do this morning here at Webb Chapel. And I said, we're going to do an overview of the life of Christ ending at the resurrection. And they said, how in the world do you do an overview of the life of Christ in an hour? And I said, you can't. You cannot do an overview of the life of Christ in an hour. In fact, you can't do it in two hours. You couldn't do it in 24 hours. You couldn't do it in a month of Sundays because Christ did so much that we couldn't even have enough books in the world to contain everything that Christ ever did. I, I label this part of our service as the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, but, but really that's kind of silly when you think about it because there was no delineation between his life and his ministry because his life was his ministry. His life was the people that he met along the way who were hurting. His life was the people that started to see that the status quo of the Jewish culture was really not something to be proud of. That tradition was being held up over the Word of God, the spirit of what God had in mind when He gave the law. Jesus came to those people, and He taught those people like they had never been taught before. He came to those people and He did things that nobody else had ever done. And I could stay here this morning, I could tell you about Jesus turning water to wine and it being the very best wine that had ever been made. I could, I could tell you about Jesus feeding the 4,000, about Jesus feeding the 5,000. I could tell you about him walking on water and calling Peter out to him on the water and Peter walking on water, but when he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to sink that Jesus was there to lift him up just like he does for us because you see even though Jesus isn't here with us we're still a part of his ministry today we're still a part of his life as the bride of Christ I can tell you about the woman who came to draw water at the hottest part of the day because she lived a very sinful life and she didn't want to be made fun of and pointed at and snickered at so she came when she thought no one would be at the at the well but who did she meet was a, a Jewish teacher and being a Samaritan woman, she was offended that he even spoke to her. And he said, if you knew who was speaking to you, you would ask and I would give you living water and you would never thirst again. And he told her about her life. He said, you've had a sinful life up to this point. You don't have a husband. That's right. You've had several husbands. and The man you're with now is not your husband. But he continued to tell her about eternal life. And gave her the confidence to go back into a town where she was absolutely despised and hated. And she says, come see a man who told me everything I have ever done. And by the time Jesus left, they said, we first believed because of her testimony, but now we have faith in you. They crossed racial lines. They crossed spiritual lines to be able to have faith in a teacher who taught like nobody else. We could talk about the Last Supper, and we could talk about his betrayal, and we're going to do that a little bit later today. But we still couldn't do it all. We could not, in the time allotted, and even without, even more than the time allotted, talk about the whole life of ministry of Jesus Christ. I want to share another quote with you this morning that I think talks about what we're saying here. For I know he was hungry, and I know that with five loaves he fed 5,000. I know he was thirsty, and I know that he turned the water into wine. 
I know that he was carried in a ship, and I know that he walked on the sea. I know that he died, and I know that he raised the dead. I know that he was set before Pilate, and I know that he sits with the Father on his throne. I know that he was worshipped by angels, and I know that he was stoned by the Jews. And truly, some of these I ascribe to the human and others to the divine nature. For by reason of this, he is said to have been both God and man. Nobody else has ever been God and man. No one else has ever lived a sinless life. No one else could have gone to the cross of Calvary and given their blood as a payment for our sins. Nobody could do that. Only Jesus. And we focus a great deal on the cross. We focus a great deal on these things, but his whole life led up to that. His whole life was a ministry. And we are to be like Christ. We are to live a life that is a ministry. We are to live a life that constantly points back to our Father God and gives him all the glory for all the good in our lives. We are to live a life that even we are in sorrow that we give glory to God. We've come together today to celebrate Jesus on this Easter Sunday. We're going to, in just a moment, partake in the Lord's Supper, but before we do that, we're going to sing some songs that hopefully put us in that right mindset to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're told in Paul's letters that each man should examine himself before he partakes of the bread and of the, of the cup. This is a great time to do that, to examine ourselves, to make sure that our minds are in the right place as we celebrate Jesus. I love you, Lord, and I live my voice to Yeah. 
Today, the world celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The day that this celebrates is celebrated on is referred to as Easter Sunday, which occurs once a year. On the other hand, those people who are disciples of Jesus Christ celebrate his resurrection every week when, he, when they partake in the Lord's Supper. But before we do that, let's look back at what was happening on the night that Jesus was betrayed and handed over to those who would crucify him. Jesus and his disciples were gathered together in an upper room eating the Passover feast. During this feast, the Jews were to remember the day when God freed the Hebrew slaves from their bondage under the Egyptians. It was during this meal that Jesus established the Lord's Supper. As we partake of this feast, let us remember Jesus sacrificed, freed us from the bondage of sin. Now let us celebrate the, the feast of the Lord's Supper. Our Father in heaven, we can never thank you enough for the gift of Jesus and his sacrifice through which we have the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life with you. As we partake of this bread, which represents his body that was given for us, let us remember what all Jesus did for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. pray again. Our Father in heaven, as we now partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' blood, let us look at how this, his blood cleanses our souls every day. And let us remember his sacrifice and what he did for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. time we'd like to dismiss our children to children's worship. Uh, if you're a guest, they'll gather right over here outside this door where they'll be led to where they'll worship. En este momento nos gustaría despedir a nuestros hijos a la adoración de los niños.
was about this time of year. Jesus had been with his disciples about three years up to this point. And being good Jewish men, they would have been looking forward to the Passover. They would have been looking forward to remembering about when their spiritual and physical ancestors were led out of the land of Egypt, out of Egyptian captivity. And Jesus said, go and go in to the place that we're going to have and make present preparations. And they went to that upper room that night and they, like all of their lives, began to celebrate that Passover feast. They ate with their shoes on because that was tradition. We know that they, they celebrated things that were so familiar to them, but at one point in that meal, Jesus did some things differently. Jesus washed their feet. He wrapped a garment around himself. He took a basin of water and he went and he washed the disciples' feet. And Peter, being zealous Peter, said, no, that's, that's the job for a servant. You, you can't. I won't let you wash my feet. And Jesus says, Peter, if I don't do this, then you have no part of me. And Peter, being zealous Peter, said, well, then give me, wash my whole body. The feet were good enough. And then he, he took bread. He said, this is my body. And every time you take of this, you need to remember me. He, he took a cup of wine. He said, this is my blood of a new covenant. And every time you drink it, remember of me. And he said, one of you is going to betray me. He knew Judas was going to betray him. In fact, I dare say that Jesus chose Judas to be one of the disciples because he needed somebody with the mental capability to betray someone that he claimed to love. They went to Gethsemane, to a very somber and very quiet place, and Jesus prayed to God. And he prayed many things that night, but the overwhelming message of the prayer that Jesus prayed that night was, let them be one, Father as you and I are one. That was Jesus' greatest desire. That in this new covenant that he was going to establish, in this new covenant bought and paid for by the blood he would pour out on the tree of Calvary, that we as believers, as disciples, would be one in this new covenant. And it was an emotional time. He, he was sweating, he was crying, he sweat so much and was in so much distress that he actually started to sweat blood. And sometimes people read that and they say, oh, that's, that's literary license. No, there's no literary license. It's a physical condition. You, you can actually sweat blood in times of great distress. And we know that he was betrayed by a kiss that Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, kissed Jesus on the cheek. We know that, that Peter, again, being zealous Peter, drew a sword, he cut off the ear of Malchus, and Jesus rebuked him. He said, Peter, don't you know those who live by the sword will die by the sword? And he was led away to trial. The Jews, they didn't really want to look bad, so they turned him over to Pilate. And Pilate said, I find no fault with this man. But they demanded that a criminal be released and that Jesus take his place. And Pilate said, I wash my hands of all of this. And so Jesus had his garment stripped away. He had a crown of thorns placed upon his head. He, he carried his own cross. And that's where we find ourselves in the book of John. So they delivered him over so he delivered him over to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus. And he went out bearing his own cross to the place, the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Galgatha. They were, they were there, they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place Jesus was crucified 
was near them in the city, and it was written in Aramaic, and in Latin, and in Greek. Now remember, just a few days before, Jesus had been ushered in to the city on a donkey. They had thrown palm fronds at his feet, and they hailed him as the king of the Jews. They hailed him as their savior. And some of those same people, not all of them, but some of them were there at the cross. Some of them were there, and some of them were yelling along with the crowd, crucify, crucify, while others were there in the deepest of sorrow, weeping and mourning, because they saw an innocent man who never did any harm to anyone placed upon a cross, the most vile and wretched way to kill somebody in that day at the most detestable place. How would you like it if it was your loved one taken to a place called the skull to be killed? That's exactly what happened in this place. Every place serves a purpose. This place, our church building, serves as sometimes it's called a house of worship. Galgatha was a place of death. There was nothing else going on there but death. And not even death for good people. Death for criminals. Death for people who stole and murdered. Death for people that deserved to be put to death according to the law. And yet, the Savior of the world is put on a cross and suspended between heaven and earth. A man who did nothing wrong. Who did nothing except help people his entire life. His reward it was a crown of thorns, nails on a cross, and a borrowed tomb. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. I'm not sure if you understand the physics of crucifixion, but you're laid down on a cross on the ground, and they drive stakes through your forearm bones, and they drive a stake through your ankles. And then you're hoisted up, and all of your body weight weighs on those spikes in your forearms. You literally asphyxiate. You don't suffocate, you asphyxiate. And so for Jesus to be, even be able to speak, he had to hoist himself up on the spikes that were holding him onto the cross. Can you imagine the kind of pain that he must have felt? Can you imagine the social anxiety and the embarrassment that he must have felt being up there wearing hardly anything as a modest Jewish man? But he did that because... He loved his mother so much, the young mother that became pregnant by the Holy Spirit, the young mother who had to bear the shame and revile of people thinking that she was just an unwed mother, that she was a woman of loose moral character, but a woman who loved him as her own son because he was her own son. And he said to the disciple whom he loved, his very best friend in the world, in essence, Take care of my mother. We don't know where Joseph was. Many scholars think maybe he had died at this point in his life, but Jesus wanted to make sure that Mary was taken care of. And that's the epitome of the life of Christ. That even in the worst times of his life, when he was struggling, when he was hurting, when others were hurling insults at him, he wanted to make sure that mother was taken care of. And we're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to make sure other people are taken care of, even when we're struggling in some way. And so he hung up on that cross for a long time. It was a painful, agonizing death. Add to it the insult of the people that were at the foot of the cross, hurling insults and probably other physical things at him. And finally, when he, it was time... He took that, that drink of wine vinegar and he again hoists himself up on the very spikes holding him into the cross. In a loud voice he says, 
It is finished. He died. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and he took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. And so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the, the burial custom of the Jews. Jesus was not a, a man of wealth. He was not a, a man of great means. In fact, it's said that Jesus oftentimes didn't have a place to lay his head every night. Certainly no place to call his own. And so Jesus didn't have the means to have a place to have his body laid to rest. He had to depend on the kindness of someone to allow him to borrow a tomb. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came to claim that body. If you, were, if you were just reading this, you would think, that was so kind of those men to come and to claim the body of Christ, to prepare him for burial, to literally be his pallbearers, to place him into the tomb that was borrowed. But if we look back in the story of Jesus, back to John chapter 3, you find a man named Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee, a teacher of the Jews, a highly respected man. And one night, so as not to be seen by everyone else, Nicodemus came to Jesus, and they had a conversation and that conversation was one of skepticism on the part of Nicodemus. It was one of teaching on the part of Jesus. And then they departed. And I'm sure Nicodemus was glad that nobody saw him there because he wasn't quite ready to let people know that maybe he was going to question the system. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus is being questioned by Pharisees. They're trying to trip him up on some part of logic, and Nicodemus very subtly comes to his aid. And yet when he is questioned about it, he doesn't have a, a whole lot to say about that. But in the time where Jesus needed Nicodemus the most, when he could not help himself because death had come to his physical body, Nicodemus risked everything. He risked his standing in Jewish culture. He risked his standing as a Pharisee. And he came and he claimed the body of a man that he was no longer ashamed of, but he was glad to call his Lord and his Savior. And it's amazing that even though Jesus was no longer with them physically, that he was still affecting people on this level, that he would be willing to give up everything that he had to, to take Jesus and to help prepare his body and to lay him in that borrowed tomb. But you know, we're not here today to talk about a borrowed tomb. We're here today to talk about an empty tomb. In John chapter 20, we read, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, when it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, to one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken our Lord from the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stopping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went to the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. So, for as they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, as she, and as she wept, 
she stopped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be a gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. It's not about a borrowed tomb, it's about an empty tomb. That empty tomb represents Jesus' power over death. That empty tomb represents the fulfillment of a covenant that Jesus came to establish. That empty tomb, that resurrection, is our victory over sin. Without the empty tomb, there is no reconciliation. Without the empty tomb, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the empty tomb, we don't come together to celebrate every week the life and teachings of Jesus Christ because without the empty tomb, he was just another man. But he's not just another man. In fact, he's not a man anymore. He is the Son of God. He sits at the right hand of God. He intercedes on our behalf. He is the author and perfecter and mediator of the new covenant. He is what we believe in. He is our hope. He is our victory. And so today, if you have not claimed victory over sin, we would love to talk to you about that. We would love to tell you that how when we become aware of the sin in our lives and we understand that we can't have victory over sin of our own accord, that we need to confess Jesus to be the Lord of our life, that we need to repent, to stop doing what we're doing, that we need to be baptized, that is immersed in a watery grave of baptism, just like that tomb was a grave, baptism is a grave. And in that grave, our sins are washed away. We gain the victory over sin, and we come up out of that, we are like Jesus was, brand new. We are clean. We are in the eyes of God and man, sinless. And so today, if you have not done that, if you have not claimed your victory over death, we would love to assist you in that. Maybe you're here today and you're just struggling. Sometimes around holidays, people tend to struggle. Sometimes people come on holidays to worship when they don't come the rest of the year. Maybe you realize there's some things in your life you'd like to make better. We'd like to help you make those things better. We'd like to pray with you. We'd like to come alongside you. We'd like to love you as part of our family here at Web Chapel. If you're joining us on our live stream today, happy Easter. There's some points of contact on the screen. If you need something, you can reach out to us and we will be happy to help you. If you are here today and you need to make a public response to the Lord's invitation, please do so as we stand and as we sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is a light, my strength, my soul.
Thank you, David, for leading us in worship this morning and everyone else who participated. Thank you so much for sharing with us your souls and your hearts this morning. We're so thankful that everyone's here, whether you're here in person, uh, our live streaming, whether you're one of our guests or one of our members, we are so happy that you're here. I see some extended family. Uh, it's good to see uh, the grandkids and great grandkids of some of our members. And we're very glad that you're here with us today as well. I'd like to uh, encourage you to take the bulletin. Uh, if you didn't see one back there, please pick one up. They are there. Uh, we have several we want to mention. Uh, Joyce Baduran is still in rehab uh, in Louisville. Uh, please be in prayer for her and her family. Uh, she is scheduled to get a port in sometime soon uh, and begin her cancer treatment. Also, Sarah Faith is home. I uh, understand that she's already been back supporting the police department and working at their facility, so we're glad to hear that as well. Also in the bulletin, you'll find information on our ministries, on our missionaries, uh, and the activities of the church. Please don't uh, let your not reading the bulletin make you miss things. After we get through today, we'll have classes for all ages, and we would encourage you to attend those classes. We'll have a brief time of fellowship out in the foyer, and we hope that you will attend that as well. A couple of verses I would like to leave us with. 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And in Romans 6, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. What an incredible blessing to gather each week and to think about the importance of the resurrection of Christ and the impact it has on our very souls. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful to be in your presence this morning to recognize your majesty to recognize your power and your love for us. Father, we're thankful for the plan that you put in place that Jesus Christ could come here as 100% man and 100% God and live among us, set the pace, preach, teach, leave us his word, and give us all that we need, Father, to follow you. Help us as we go forth today that we will have a boldness of spirit and of heart to teach others about you, to live for you every single day of our life, and to be strong in the faith until you call us home. Thank you for the blessing of being able to be together to worship you this morning, to further study as we go to class, and to think about the blessings that you give us every day in that we are your children. In Christ's name we pray, amen.